So I will talk about the hemodynamics of uh, aortic stenosis and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Uh, I have other uh, talks recorded about those topics and about valve area stenosis calculations. I suggest you review those. I will show today mainly in new cases to illustrate those concepts. So I will start with this tracing. This is a simultaneous LV aortic pressure recording. I want you to look at this and try to think what is the diagnosis. And to make it easier, normally when you see simultaneous LV aortic recording, there are two big diagnoses uh, that should come to your mind whenever there is a difference between the LV and aortic systolic pressure. One is aortic stenosis, the other is dynamic LVOT obstruction. Which one is this one? Yes, true, this is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And here is how you can tell. This is a, a classic dynamic LVOT obstruction. You see the LV and aortic pressures hug each other at the beginning of systole. Then later on in mid to late systole, you start having that dynamic LVOT obstruction. And so what happens, the LV pressure will start peaking late as in a late dagger shape morphology and the aortic pressure will drop in a spike and dome morphology because the obstruction occurs late. So the gradient occurs late and you get a late peaking dagger shape LV and the spike and dome aortic morphology. The dome is as the aortic pressure drops after the initial rise when the obstruction happens. So the key is that those upstrokes hug each other, then you get a late gradient and a late obstruction. This is very characteristic of LVOT obstruction. Okay, and the more severe the obstruction, the more striking that spike and dome morphology of the aorta will become. Okay. And so the explanation is that early on in a systole, the ventricle is it's very filled and it's large. So you have less obstruction in early systole. The more you go through systole, the more that left ventricle empties, the more you get a drag on that mitral valve and you more you, the more you get approximation of the mitral valve leaflet, anterior leaflet and the septum and the more you get obstruction throughout systole. It gets worse as you go through systole, hence that late peaking LV pressure and late peaking gradient. And this is the morphology difference between aortic stenosis and dynamic LVOT obstruction. So we talked about spike and dome in LVOT obstruction for the aortic pressure, early peaking aortic pressure with a spike and dome morphology versus late peaking left ventricular pressure and late gradient. And it's more pronounced in more severe obstruction. That morphology will be more pronounced in more severe obstruction. On the other hand, look at how aortic stenosis uh, looks. In aortic stenosis, the aortic upstroke is not hugging the LV upstroke, is not parallel to the LV upstroke. It starts uh, normal just very briefly, very early on, that aortic upstroke starts normally for a brief period. Then you hit that aortic valve opening of, let's say, 0.8 centimeter squares. And therefore, after that, you start having the obstruction and the aortic upstroke becomes sluggish afterward. And the aortic pressure ends up peaking late, unlike here where it peaks early and the obstruction is late. Here, the aortic pressure peaks late after it hits that valve area of 0.8 centimeters squares, let's say. So you get what we call that pulsus tardus and that slow upstroke of aortic pressure. You also get this, that bend that I talk about, when the aortic upstroke becomes impeded at that valve limiting area, which is let's say 0.8 centimeters square. That point where the aortic pressure bends is what we call the anacrotic notch, which is characteristic of aortic stenosis. When that anacrotic notch happens on a low portion of the aortic upstroke, 
early on on the aortic upstroke, it would be characteristic of severe aortic stenosis. Another characteristic of severe aortic stenosis is that the pulse pressure tends to be narrow. Uh, this is what we call a pulsus parvus because you're not having much stroke volume ejected from the left ventricle. So this is what we call for the aortic pressure and in aortic stenosis, pulses parvus, narrow pulse pressure, and pulses tardus, late peaking aortic pressure with an anacrotic notch. Some other features of aortic stenosis I want to discuss here is the gradient and the aortic valve area. Frequently, when we talk about aortic stenosis, we talk about three types of gradient, and sometimes fellows get confused about what is what. Particularly, they get confused about what's the difference between peak-to-peak -peak and peak instantaneous gradient. So there are three types of gradient in aortic stenosis. One is what we call the mean gradient, which is the integration of that pressure gradient area between the LV and aorta, that gray area. It's the integration and averaging of that gray area. Uh, this is what you use as mean gradient over 40 millimeter of mercury to define severe AS as a very specific diagnostic marker of severe AS. Then you have what we call the peak instantaneous gradient, which is the gradient at any moment in time. You take all gradient at, at all moments in time between LV and aorta, and the highest instantaneous physiologic gradient is what we call peak instantaneous gradient, which is what you get by echo as correlation of peak velocity, four by velocity square. That's the peak instantaneous gradient. Those two, you get them by echo, mean and peak instantaneous gradient. You can also get them by cath. The third type of gradient is the peak to peak gradient. This one is not physiologic, and it's only obtained by cath. You look at the peak LV pressure and the peak aortic pressure, and you look at the difference between the two. It's a very simple and easy eyeball type of gradient that we like to do in the cath lab. So peak to peak is very different from peak instantaneous gradient, very different from mean gradient, which is the gray area. Now we are somewhat lucky in the cath lab because peak to peak gradient is often uh, equal approximately to the mean gradient. So I want you to know the approximation and the correlation between those three types of gradient. And I always quiz that in the cath lab, so please know it very well. Mean gradient is usually approximately equal to peak to peak gradient, and it's approximately two thirds of the peak instantaneous gradient. And if you forget, just remember the guidelines definition of severe AS, mean gradient is over 40. So this is almost two thirds of that. And it's almost equal, the mean is almost equal to peak to peak. There could be few millimeter of mercury discrepancy, uh, but they're generally approximately equal. What's important is in the guidelines definition of AS, the gradients are very specific for severe AS. Meaning if you fulfill the gradient criteria for AS, you, you do have severe AS, you don't even need to look at the valve area. However, the problem is that uh, frequently you can have severe AS without those high gradient, whether your EF is normal or whether it's slow, whether your flow is normal or your flow is low. And that's why we use also the aortic valve area to define severe AS. The aortic valve area is the ultimate definition of severe AS, meaning you can have a valve area less than one with, like I said, a gradient less than 40, meaning gradient less than 40. The problem with using aortic valve area to define S is that it's uh, non-specific by echo, very non-specific by echo. Actually, half of the patients whose valve area is less than one by echo and the gradient is less than 40 by echo, half of those patients have no severe AS, they just have miscalculation of valve area by echo. So that's the problem. Aortic valve area is the ultimate definition of aortic stenosis. However, it's subject to a lot of miscalculation by echo in particular. It's less subject to error by cath. And that's why a lot of those patients with low gradient and low valve area by echo end up being referred to cath 
to confirm whether their valve area is truly less than one with a low gradient. The problem by cath is that even cath valve area calculation is not very specific. It can have error, as I will show you later with valve area calculation. Uh, you know, we use CARAC output to calculate that valve area and CARAC output is, is subject to variability. When you do thermodilution CARAC output, you can see that we get a lot of variability and standard deviation between various measurements of uh, thermodilution. So you can have a problems by cath less so than by echo. However, I would say that low gradient severe AS, the gradient is usually between 20 to 40, maybe 15 to 40. It's extremely unlikely for a truly severe AS to have a gradient less than 15. Even truly severe, low flow, low gradient AS, extremely unlikely to, to, to translate into a gradient less than 15. So really probably don't refer gradient less than 15 for further evaluation. And I'm talking about mean gradient less than 15. Another idea I want to highlight about uh, severe aortic stenosis, I describe those pulse starters and the anacrotic notch. There is one caveat to those hemodynamic feature of AS is the elderly and patients with a severely non-compliant artery, such as a dialysis patient. Those patients have such non-compliant arteries then even when the aorta get hit with a small, tiny stroke volume, the pressure will shoot up and will shoot down. So those patients will have a normal pulse pressure or even at times a wide pulse pressure despite severe AS and the pressure will shoot abruptly up. So they are not going to have an acrotic notch and nor pulses sparvus and nor pulses tardus. So those features may be absent in the elderly or the patient with very non-compliant arteries. So keep that in mind. The absence of those does not exclude AS in specific patients. However, you will never have aortic and LV pressure hugging each other in severe aortic stenosis. Okay. Another important uh, idea here, just going back to Hocom features after I discussed both, uh, that late peaking a dagger shape LV pressure and LV gradient is what you see on echo when you measure by Doppler the velocity across the LVOT. You see that velocity has a late peaking dagger shape, which is characteristic of uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, similar to the cath. This area between the dome of the aorta and the late peaking LV is what you see by echo. That gray area is what you see by echo as the late dagger shape LV aortic pressure gradient. So please uh, memorize these slides to understand the difference between dynamic LVT obstruction hemodynamics and aortic stenosis hemodynamics. Okay. On occasion, you can have another form of fixed obstruction that can have similar morphology, such as the subaortic membrane, subaortic aortic stenosis, uh, which is the congenital membrane. Uh, that uh, subaortic AS will have a morphology somewhat similar to aortic stenosis, depending on its severity. Most often it's not severe in adults, the subaortic uh, stenosis. Another uh, hemodynamic feature of LVOT, dynamic LVOT obstruction that I want you to know is, okay, what gradient do we use in LVOT obstruction? So I discussed how in aortic stenosis, we have the three types of gradient and we use all three with different cutoffs. What gradient do we use in HOCOM? Is it a peak to peak, peak instantaneous or mean gradient? So very important idea, in HOCOM, we do not use mean gradient. Mean gradient, which is the most important gradient in severe aortic stenosis, we do not use it in HOCOM. When we see us talking about uh, gradient in HOCOM, we're talking about peak instantaneous gradient by echo, and we're talking about peak to peak gradient by cath. We don't talk about mean gradient. Mean gradient is, uh, not valuable physiologically in HOCOM. Why? 
because the obstruction is mainly mid to late systole, as I described. If you do mean gradient, you will be integrating that early systolic area between LV and aorta, that narrow band here, and it will make the gradient look much less than it is because you're integrating an area that has zero gradient. So the mean gradient has no value physiologically in HOCOM. Uh, we use peak instantaneous gradient by echo and peak to peak gradient by cath. And luckily for us, they are almost equal to each other. So peak to peak is almost equal to peak instantaneous gradient in HOCOM. Also peak to peak is almost equal to mean gradient in S, not peak instantaneous gradient in S. And that's kind of, we're lucky in the cath lab. Peak to peak gradient, which is this very easy eyeball type of gradient, approximates the most important gradient in AS, which is the mean. It also approximates the most important gradient in HOCOM, which is the peak. For example, here, the peak to peak gradient is this, here to here. That's the peak to peak gradient. The peak instantaneous gradient is somewhere around here. Those two will end up being equal to each other within a few millimeter of mercury of each other. So I hope you understood that, and I want you to know what do we consider significant gradient. This is a standard definition. Peak to peak or peak instantaneous gradient more than 30 millimeter of mercury at rest or more than 50 millimeter with dynamic maneuvers that I will describe. Now to qualify for septal ablation uh, procedures, both those, whether at rest or with maneuver, need to meet the 50 millimeter of mercury cutoff, okay? Now, a, a hallmark feature of dynamic alveolar obstruction is that it is dynamic. You can do maneuver to make that gradient worse or better. There are three physiologic features that can make that gradient change. Gradient goes up similarly to contractility. So if you have increased contractility, the gradient will go up. The gradient moves in an opposite direction to both the preload and afterload. So if you reduce the preload or redu you reduce your afterload, the gradient and your LVOT obstruction will worsen. Why? Because reduction in preload and reduction afterload will reduce the LV cavity size, which will result in more mitral valve drag and more approximation of the septum and the anterior mitral leaflet and therefore more LVOT obstruction, more gradient, more spike and dome morphology of the aorta, okay? So gradient moves in similar direction to contractility and in opposite direction to preload and afterload. One of the maneuvers we use is Valsalva, which reduces preload and causes an increase in gradient, okay? Exercise causes an increase in preload, however, it also causes an increase in contractility and that trumps the increase in preload. That's why exercise causes an increase in gradient. Interestingly, post-exercise is the time you get your highest gradient, more than exercise, post, immediate post-exercise. Why? Because in immediate post-exercise, your contractility is still high, but your preload, your venous return is starting to decline. So you get high contractility without as much rise in preload. Your highest gradient, your highest physiologic gradient is your post-exercise gradient. Okay, so please understand that slide very, very well. Another feature, which is number three here of a dynamic LVOT obstruction is this. So this is another case, another patient. First, think. This is LV pressure and aortic pressure. What's the diagnosis? Is it AS or is it HOCOM? So yes, this is HOCOM and this is what we call the Brockenbrough phenomenon. Correct. So one, this is HOCOM because of the morphology, the aorta and LV pressure hug each other. Then at one point you get that late peak dagger LV and spike and dome morphology, spike and dome morphology of the aorta. Then you have this, what we call the Brockenbrough phenomena after a pause, in this case, after a PVC. So when you have a PVC, you get, after it, you get two things. You get an increase in preload, but more importantly, you get an increase in contractility. Fellows get 
confused because whenever th they think of a pause and broken row, they think the first reflex that comes to their mind, oh, the preload increases. Well, no, preload increase does not explain this phenomenon. Okay, so what happens is after a PVC, you get an increase in contractility, which creates much worse an obstruction. You get also an increase in preload, but the increase in contractility is more important and trumps the increase in preload. Therefore, despite the increase in preload, you're getting much more obstruction from the increase in contractility and you're getting much higher gradient, okay? So that's one feature of broken bro, but that's not even the most important feature. So broken bro means that after a PVC or a pause, you get a worsening of the LV aortic gradient, but more importantly, you get a drop in the aortic pulse pressure, okay? This is the broken bro. You get an increase in LV pressure and LV aorta gradient, but you get a drop in the aortic pressure and a drop in the aortic mainly pulse pressure, more important than the aortic systolic pressure, drop in the aortic pulse pressure. This is because the obstruction that is dynamic is worsening after a PVC. So we're getting less stroke volume coming out of the LV after a pause, and therefore the aortic pulse pressure is declining. Moreover, you don't just get a uh, narrowing of the pulse pressure, you get a more striking spike and dome morphology. Again, you worsen the obstruction, you worsen the spike and dome. Look here on this bit, there wasn't much of a gradient. There was not much of a spike and dome, but after a PVC, dramatic spike and dome. You see that? When we say dynamic LVOT obstruction, we're talking about dynamic gradient, but also dynamic aortic morphology and LV morphology. It's a dynamic spike and dome morphology. More obstruction, more spike and dome. Less obstruction, less spike and dome, okay? This is another illustration of that broken bro phenomenon. So you get here uh, LVOT obstruction with a mild gradient. You get a PVC and afterward, you get much bigger gradient, a drop in the aortic pulse pressure, and a nice spike and dome morphology, spike and dome, spike and dome, okay? So distinguish this from aortic stenosis, the fixed obstruction. What happens after a PVC in fixed obstruction, you also get an increase in gradient. In both HOCOM and AS, you do get an increase in gradient, but it's a different mechanism. In fixed obstruction, after a pause, and increased LV contractility, you're not going to get worsened obstruction. The obstruction is the same, but you're going to get more gradient because the gradient is very dependent on flow. You have higher flow across the aortic valve. You're going to get higher pressure gradient across the aortic valve. That's according to the Gorlin equation. However, unlike Hocom and Brockenbro, the aortic pulse pressure will also rise. You get more preload and more contractility, you're going to get more stroke volume across the aortic valve because the obstruction is not worsening. Therefore, you're getting a wider aortic pressure and a wider pulse pressure, okay? So in AS, after a pause, everything rises. LV rises, aortic pressure rises, and the gradient rises. Evidently, the gradient rises much less dramatically than in Hocom. That's why on exam, with Hocom, the murmur is dynamic with maneuver. For example, with Valsalva or with a PVC. With PVC, the gradient is very dynamic. You get a much more pronounced murmur uh, after a PVC in Hocom. You get an increase in murmur in AS, but it's much more subtle. So much so that, you know, for practical reasons, whenever the murmur gets dramatically worse with after a PVC, it's, you, we think of Hocom much more uh, than we think of aortic stenosis. Okay, another interesting feature of Hocom by exam, after a PVC, your murmur gets worse, but your pulse on exam drops. Again, notice the spike and dome morphology gets more pronounced. This is another feature of um, Hocom. So here, this slide summarizes all those features. The morphology of the LV, of the aorta, the broken bro phenomena after a pause, and the gradient is dynamic with maneuvers that I explain here. Another feature of number four is this. The gradient is dynamic spontaneously. 
It's a very interesting characteristic. Look at this. This is the same patient at one point during cardiac catheterization. There is no gradient. Well, if you stop your study here, well, you'll say, okay, this patient has no LVOT obstruction or minimal LVOT obstruction. However, at another time of the study, even outside of that PVC, all of a sudden we started to have a gradient. Even outside maneuvers, you start to have that late dagger. Look at that LV shape here versus the LV shape here. This is what I call that late peaking, you know? It can almost stab you. It's very peaky, very narrow. So this is uh, the late peaking dagger and the spike and dome spontaneously. And conversely here at some point, you lost it. This is on the same tracing within 10 seconds, you had obstruction here, you have no obstruction here. And that's a very characteristic feature of HOCOM. That's why it's important to be patient when you're doing recording in a patient where you suspect LVOT, dynamic LVOT obstruction. You need to do your recording over several minutes. One study from Mayo Clinic showed that even outside maneuver, 50% of patients will get important vi variability at, at rest, even without maneuver, within seven minutes of recording. Why does this happen? That shows you how dynamic that LVOT obstruction. It can vary with a lot of physiologic variables, such as, for example, respiration, a change in loading condition, change in patient sedation and wakefulness, change in patient's heart rate. Faster heart rate, you may get an increase in uh, contractility with that, and you may get more gradient. Uh, so a lot of variable can affect that gradient even spontaneously without you doing maneuvers. So that's a very common phenomenon with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. This is another case. I mean, look, this is within 10 seconds. Here you have not much of a gradient. Now you have a spike and dome and a pronounced gradient. Now in this case, it coincided if you look with expiration. Expiration can make Hocom gradient more pronounced. Uh, this is what we call the reverse pulses paradoxes. Expiration actually reduces LV afterload. The positive pressure reduces LV afterload, which may cause more gradient. But in some patients, it's inspiration. Inspiration reduces LV preload. It actually increases RV preload, but it reduces LV preload, and it may cause more gradient. Uh, so it's it's hard uh, to tell. You, I've seen it with both inspiration and expiration, more pronounced gradient. Again, we don't always know why, but we know it does change, okay? In this particular case, you know, the heart rate here is a little faster than the heart rate here, and that could be why he had more gradient. Faster heart rate, more contractility, according to the Bowditch or Trappy phenomenon, okay? Uh, you do get lower preload with faster heart rate, but contractility is more important, and it trumps the effect of the preload. So uh, a lot of potential explanations, okay? This is another case. There is no gradient at rest or minimal gradient between the LV and the aorta. Then we did Valsalva here. And after Valsalva, we created a nice gradient between the LV and aorta with a spike and dome morphology. So those are the maneuvers we commonly perform in the cath lab. Outside watching what happens spontaneously, we can do Valsalva and we induce PVCs with our catheter and we try to see whether Brock and Brock phenomena happens, okay? And this is with PVC in this patient. Again, the Brock and Brock phenomena after a PVC, spike and dome and late peaking LV pressure, striking increase in pressure gradient, okay? Actually here the, L, the pulse pressure also dramatically declines. Very much so, that area under the aortic pressure dramatically declines compared to this. This is another case. I try to make the diagnosis here and please give me your answers. Interestingly, if you look at this recording here, I mean, you have a very wide aortic pulse pressure and you don't have an acrotic notch. And the LV and aortic pressure are not hugging each other, but they are not very far from each other. So it's a wide pulse pressure. Definitely no pulses parvus and no anacrotic notch. Doesn't fit with aortic stenosis. Yet you have a big gradient. This is a gradient of over 40 millimeter of mercury. Each box here is 20 millimeter of mercury. So you have a big gradient. 
yet you have no striking features of aortic stenosis. So it makes you wonder, is this really aortic stenosis? Uh, indeed, it is aortic stenosis. It cannot be dynamic alveolar tube obstruction because again, if you have dynamic alveolar tube obstruction with that much gradient, you will have a spike and dome morphology and late peaking dagger shape, which we don't have here. We don't have that classic dagger shape, but most importantly, we don't have a spike and dome. And the aorta and LV should be hugging each other. Here, look, when you have obstruction, they absolutely hug each other. Look, they absolutely hug each other. So the fact that they don't absolutely hug each other is very much against dynamic LVOT obstruction. So what the diagnosis he is here eventually is severe aortic stenosis in an old lady who's 85 years old with very stiff and non-compliant arteries. And we're seeing that frequently these days as we deal with uh, very elderly with severe aortic stenosis is that we don't always have that anacrotic notch and pulses tardis and parvus, okay? So this is severe aortic stenosis with a peak to peak gradient of over 45 millimeter of mercury, it's 45 to 50 millimeter of mercury without the classic aortic pressure feature, features of aortic stenosis. Another thing that helps you here is evidently the pause. And I should have shown this tracing without the pause to make it more difficult. But with the pause, we definitely don't have a broken bow. After a pause, you can see the aortic pulse pressure increases rather than decline. The gradient rises as well. Everything rises. LV rises, the aortic pressure rises, and the gradient rises. So we don't have a broken bow phenomena, which is further evidence that this patient has does not have hokum. Okay, it's aortic stenosis. It's not dynamic obstruction. Okay. This is another illustration of the lack of uh, broken bro. Again, when I say broken bro, assess the aortic pulse pressure. Don't be obsessed or focus on the aortic systolic pressure because the aortic systolic pressure can drop with uh, inspiration, depending on when that beat is coincide, coinciding with the respiratory cycle. For example, here, after a pause, the aortic systolic pressure is dropping, but most importantly, the aortic pulse pressure is rising. Look at this compared to that, or compared to that, it's much rising, the aortic pulse pressure. So this is no broken bro. This is consistent with fixed obstruction. Okay. There is one possible diagnosis of this tracing before considering it AS, and that is error in measurement, such as error in zeroing or error in damping of the two recording systems. There does not seem to be an error in damping as both tracings seem to be properly damped with a proper notching and with good upstrokes. They are not over damped, which is good. Ensure both transducers are zeroed at the same level and swap transducers to ensure you obtain the same gradient. Then do pullback to verify there is no error in damping causing a false gradient. And this is the pullback in this patient. Notice when we do the pullback, you have to make sure whether in aortic stenosis or hokum, you have a catheter in the LV, a catheter in the aorta, you want to make sure that LV and aortic pressure superimpose on pullback. If they don't, as in this case, that means you had a problem with your recording. You could either have a problem in zeroing, your transducer are not zero at the same level, which create a fake artificial gradient, or as in this particular case, you have an error in damping. Here, this purple uh, catheter is too damped compared to that blue catheter. The damping could be at the level of the catheter or at the level of the tubing compared to the blue, which tells you here if you had a gradient when that blue was in the LV, if you had a gradient and you pull back and you get this, well, that tells you that the gradient you had when you were in the LV was an artificial gradient created by the fact that your aortic catheter is damped. You need to redo your recording whether uh, correct your tubing or correct your catheter. In this case, use a larger catheter potentially, avoid the damping error. I want to move to describe a valve area, how to calculate the valve area. And that applies to aortic stenosis and to mitral stenosis actually as well. 
this is how we calculate the valve area. It's the Golan equation that I want you to memorize. There are four equations you need to memorize in hemodynamics, uh, absolutely memorize, and this is one of them. So it states that the valve area is equal to flow across the valve divided by square root of mean gradient multiplied by a constant. So flow divided by square root of mean gradient. Now, here is the catch. Flow across the valve is not exactly cardiac output. Let's say the patient has a cardiac output of five liters per minute. And we're talking about, let's say the aortic valve. This five liters per minute is not crossing the aortic valve in one minute. It's crossing the aortic valve when the valve is open. So it's, it's crossing the aortic valve during the systolic time. And let's say systole is 25 seconds of the 60 seconds. So that five liter is crossing the aortic valve, not in 60 seconds, it's crossing it in the 25 seconds when the valve is open. So actually the flow across the valve is five liters per 25 seconds, not five liters per minute, okay? So the flow across the valve is cardiac output divided by systolic time. So this will translate cardiac output divided by systolic time. And this is how the equation becomes. Valve area equal cardiac output divided by systolic time, or in case of mitral valve, cardiac output divided by diastolic time in seconds per minute, okay? And what is systolic time? You can count the systolic time of every single beat throughout uh, the whole one minute. And this is how you obtain systolic time. Or the more practical way is to calculate the systolic time during one beat, what we call the systolic ejection period, and multiply that by how many beats you have per minute, the heart rate, okay? So this is the systolic eject ejection period, which is the du duration of uh, the ejection of one beat. So the way you do it, you look at the intersection between the LV and aorta. The time between those two intersection is what we call systolic, systolic ejection period in seconds per beat. So this is how we eventually come to that famous equation. Valve area equal cardiac output divided by systolic time, which is heart rate by systolic ejection period uh, by square root of mean gradient, okay? Multiplied by a constant. And the cardiac output, you multiply it by a thousand to convert it into milliliter or centimeter cube. So you can get centimeter square valve area. It's basically for unit conversion, okay? Mitral valve area is somewhat similar. It's divided by a diastolic time, which is heart rate, by the diastolic time of every beat. The diastolic time of every beat is this. So when we're doing mitral stenosis assessment, we're looking at LV pressure and LA pressure. The mitral stenosis is characterized by a gradient between the LA and the LV pressure in diastole, okay? Normally, LA and LV touch each other immediately uh, after early diastole. So there is a tiny separation in early diastole, then they immediately touch each other in a, LA and LV. Mitral stenosis is characterized by the lack of diastasis, the lack of touching of LV and LA pressure, and the gradient is that area in between. Diastolic period, diastolic filling period, is that, again, the time between the intersections of LA and LV here and here. And so mitral valve area is cardiac output divided by heart rate and diastolic filling period by square root of mean gradient. The constant of mitral valve area is a little different for valve area, it's a little smaller, 37.7 versus 44.3. The way I memorize this is the lower valve, which is the mitral valve, has the lower value, okay? All right, so you have to know that equation very well. Now, luckily for us, there is another simpler equation. This, was, this equation was established in the early 1950s. In the early 1980s, it's been demonstrated that actually 1,000 divided by those three numbers, whether in aortic or mitral valve calculation, is usually equal to one. As long as your heart rate is between 40 and 100, 1,000 divided by those is equal to one. Therefore you come with a simplified equation, which is valve area equal cardiac output divided by square root of mean gradient. That's what we call the Hacke equation. 
it's not the gold standard, but it's fairly accurate and it's very easy to calculate. So when I'm looking at this patient in the cath lab, I make the calculation in my brain. I look at, I measure the cardiac output and I'm looking at the peak to peak gradient, which is a good surrogate of mean gradient in aortic stenosis. So already in my brain, I'm making the math here. It's very easy, okay? So we love that equation. It's very handy and fairly accurate for heart rate between 40 and 100. Even though it's not validated in AFib, I find it very handy in AFib, as I will explain in a little bit. So you can use it in atrial fibrillation. All right. I want to discuss, I like those equations and I want to discuss their implications. So you don't just need to know the equations. You need to know what are their physiologic implications. So the first implication is valve area equal approximately cardiac output divided by square root of pressure gradient. You flip it around, tells you pressure gradient equal cardiac output square divided by valve area square. What, what this tells you is that pressure gradient and the hemodynamic severity of a valve stenosis is very dependent on the cardiac output. I mean, you double your cardiac output, you can quadruple your pressure gradient, whether in mitral stenosis or in aortic stenosis. So that, so that equation tells you that extreme dependency of pressure gradient on cardiac output. That explains, for example, what I showed here, uh, that even in aortic stenosis after a PVC, you know, you do get an increase in gradient because you're getting an increase in flow, okay? So that's uh, one aspect of that equation. That also explains why you have if you have a low cardiac output, your pressure gradient may be low despite a valve area of one centimeter square in aortic stenosis, okay? The second implication is guidelines cut off. And I like this very much. So let's apply uh, that Hackey equation to a patient who has a normal cardiac output at rest on the cardiac, on, on the cardiac cath table of five to 5.5 liter per minute and a valve area of one. This will translate into a gradient of, you know, late 20s to 30, not 40. And this is what we call the misalignment of valve area and gradient cutoffs in the guidelines. So the guidelines tell you a gradient over 40 or valve area less than one is severe AS. Well, those two don't match each other. A gradient uh, or valve area less than one translates under normal flow condition into a gradient of, you know, close to 30. Conversely, gradient over 40 usually translates into a valve area of less than 0.8, not just one. So the mean gradient is very specific. If you mean it, if you meet it, you have severe AS. You don't need to look at the valve area. However, it's not very sensitive in aortic stenosis. Aortic valve area is very sensitive and is diagnostic of AS, but its problem is that it's very poorly specific by echo. And it has some issues, like I explained earlier by Kath. Uh, the issues being cardiac output uh, mismeasurement by thermodilution and variability of measurement by thermodilution, uh, even worse by assumed thick equation. So that's, those are the caveat of Valvera, even though it's the ultimate definition is subject to variability and poor specificity by echo. In that second implication regarding guideline cutoff, I want to discuss the guideline cutoff of mitral stenosis. It's kind of the opposite, the guideline cutoff of mitral stenosis. You have a very, very sensitive and non-specific gradient used in mitral stenosis. Have you ever wondered this? We have the same equation that can be applied for both mitral stenosis and aortic stenosis. How come the gradient cutoff is much lower in mitral stenosis than in aortic stenosis. And let's put it this way. For mitral stenosis, it's called severe for a valve area of 1.5, not one, because at baseline, the mitral valve area is larger than the aortic valve area. And we call it severe for 1.5, and we call it very severe when the mitral valve area is less than one. Okay, so if you take a normal cardiac output and a mitral valve area of 1.5, that will translate into a gradient of 11 plus. Mitral valve area of one will translate into a gradient of 25 plus. Yet the guidelines use five millimeter of mercury for that valve area. So that tells you they are using a very generous and very sensitive cutoff that is very non-specific. I mean, to be specific for mitral stenosis, 
uh, a gradient, a mean gradient should be at the very least 10, maybe even more. That's a problem in the uh, guidelines cutoff. And I explain how they are problematic, misaligned in aortic stenosis and how they are misaligned in mitral stenosis in a different way. Their gradient is too, uh, too sensitive and not very specific. That's why mitral valve area is very important for diagnosis of anatomic MS severity and even more practically important than NAS because in MS, the gradient is also not specific. So it's very important to get mitral valve area to assess the diagnostic, the diagnosis of anatomic MS severity. In both AS and MS, valve area is important and is the ultimate definition of anatomic severity of AS and MS. But it's somewhat less important in AS if the specific mean gradient is met. Whereas, whereas in MS, regardless of the gradient, it's always important to calculate mitral valve area. Again, because you have very specific gradient cutoff for AS, less specific gradient cutoff in MS. And you can tell that just by plugging the numbers into Hackey's equation, okay? I mean, why do the guidelines use a five millimeter of mercury or a very sensitive cutoffs in mitral stenosis rather than using 10 to 15? It's just because in MS, any gradient translates into a rise of wedge pressure and, and an effect on the pulmonary vasculature. So any gradient can translate into physiologic effect. That said, that does not mean mitral valve area is severe. It's just, it means the flow conditions are making your MS hemodynamically significant without necessarily being anatomically significant. And the flow conditions can be improved without you having to treat uh, anatomically the mitral valve, structurally the mitral valve by replacing it or repairing it. And this is another point related to MS. And this is another reason that makes MS gradient poorly specific for anatomic severity. And another difference between AS and MS gradient is that MS gradient is more labile with heart rate fluctuations than AS gradient. So if you plug in the true Gorlin equation, you will see that MS is very uh, dependent on heart rate, much more than AS. Why? Because let's say we go into tachycardia, we're going from a heart rate of 60 to 100. Tachycardia will reduce the diastolic time while increasing systolic time. That's what happens during tachycardia. Diastole shrinks per minute, systole increases per minute. So what happens, that same cardiac output will now have to squeeze through a narrower diastolic time. Therefore, the diastolic flow per second, which is cardiac output divided by that reduced diastolic time will increase. The flow across the mitral valve will increase and therefore the gradient will increase, okay? The flow will increase and the gradient will increase. Conversely, for the aortic valve, that doesn't happen because in tachycardia, the cardiac output increases, the systolic time for the aortic valve will also increase. And therefore you don't get a dramatic change in gradient. You don't get dramatic change in this equation with tachycardia. What we're assuming here is the valve area is remaining stable, whether aortic or mitral valve area. We're getting changes in those, the cardiac output diastolic time and a change in gradient. So with mitral valve, you get in tachycardia, you get in, it, possibly an increase in cardiac output and a decline in diastolic time. Therefore, an increase in flow across the mitral valve and an increase in gradient, okay? That's why the mitral valve gradient is very labile with heart rate fluctuations. So that's another problem with mitral gradient, that lability with heart rate fluctuations and the fact that the guidelines are too sensitive, which makes that mitral gradient, you have to take it with a grain of salt and you absolutely have to assess the mitral valve area. The gradient is relevant physiologically. It does translate into a higher wedge pressure and higher effect on the pulmonary vasculature, but it doesn't necessarily mean the mitral valve is very tight and needs a valve repair. You can have a valve area of 1.8 to 2 that does not need repair, yet if you're tachycardic and in a high flow state and anemic, you will get a high gradient across a valve, a mitral valve of 1.8, 2 centimeters square. And what you need in those patients, you need to reduce the heart rate and treat anemia, give diuretics rather than replace or repair the valve.
Okay, so that's the importance of physiology in those patients. I will talk about one more thing, uh, atrial fibrillation. How to assess severity of valve stenosis in case of atrial fibrillation. In order to assess aortic stenosis severity by gradient in atrial fibrillation, use the highest gradient to assess severity. Here's the thing, atrial fibrillation, even if rate controlled, less than 100 beats per minute, it directly reduces cardiac output and thus it reduces the aortic stenosis gradient. Atrial fibrillation is a low output state, partly because you lose the atrial kick, partly because irregularity by itself reduces cardiac output by up to 15, 20% compared to a regular similar rate. So atrial fibrillation is a low output state, which can cause a low gradient CVRS. Therefore, in order to maximize and improve my diagnosis of severe AS, my, my sensitivity for severe AS, I prefer taking the highest gradient, which is seen usually after the longest RR interval, rather than doing what the guidelines recommend, which is averaging five to 10 beats gradients, okay? I like to take the highest gradients to compensate for that AFib low flow state. In mitral stenosis, on the other hand, I prefer to average the gradient because as I said, gradient is too sensitive in mitral stenosis and tends to exaggerate the true anatomic severity of the disease. Unlike in AS where 40 millimeter of mercury is uh, not very sensitive, okay? So that's how we assess the severity by gradient in AFib, whether by echo or cath. Now in terms of valve area, while HACA has not been specifically studied in AFib, it actually comes handy in AFib as long as the heart rate is well controlled, less than 100 to 110 beats per minute. And here the way I do it, I just plug in the HACA equation, which is cardiac output divided by square root of mean gradient. We get cardiac output by thermodilution, which will have a lot of variability. So I try to get five, at least actually five, my dilution cardiac output, and I pick the ones that are within 25% of each other. I like to have five measurements within 25% of each others. And I take those and I average them. And in terms of mean gradient, which one do I pick? In theory, you should pick for that equation, since you're taking an average cardiac output, average of multiple beats, you should take an average mean gradient, not the highest gradient like I picked here but actually you can use the high gradient. I tend to use the highest gradient with an average cardiac output from at least five measurements within 25% of each other, okay? This is an illustration of a case. This is LV uh, aorta in a patient with severe aortic stenosis. The patient is in atrial fibrillation, uh, rate controlled, uh, 80s beats per minute. Look at the gradient. The gradient here is not bad. Every box is 20 millimeter of mercury. The gradient here, you know, is about 20s, 25 millimeter of mercury, maybe 30. So it doesn't look very severe, but on other beats, it reaches almost 40. And in one beat here, it's almost even late 50, 60 millimeter of mercury. You can choose to average those, but like I told you, actually you should take the highest one to assess the severity of AS. If you do, this one is 20s, this one is, this one here is almost 60. Well, this AS is severe according to this beat and it has other features of severity. Look at that morphology. It has that pulses tardis morphology, late peaking, very late peaking aortic pressure. You get an anacrotic notch. You see that anacrotic hump here? Anacrotic hump here. So you get an anacrotic notch late peaking. This is characteristic of severe AS beside the gradient. I want to comment on another aspect of the measurement of LV pressure in HOCOM and in aortic stenosis. In HOCOM, you want to use an end hole catheter and keep it deep in the LV. Side hole catheter may cause contamination of the LV pressure with LVOT pressure across the obstruction or past the obstruction and may attenuate or dissipate the gradient. Use end hole catheter and use pullback to localize the gradient and confirm LVOT obstruction in case you have doubt whether the obstruction is at the LVOT level or the aortic level. 
This is an example of Hocom, and you can see the pressure in the LV that has a late peaking dagger shape. And as you pull back from the LV into uh, the surface of the LVOT, you can see that the gradient dissipates. Now you're past the obstruction and the LVOT pressure is similar in morphology to the aortic pressure and may have actually a spike and dome appearance. And you can tell that if you do end hole catheter pullback, not side hole catheter pullback, which will contaminate all, the, all those pressures with each other and may attenuate that gradient and may make you miss the level of the obstruction. Now, even in AS, I like to keep my catheter deep. I can use a side hole catheter, but I prefer to keep my catheter deep in the left ventricle because even in AS and as part of the AS physiology, there is usually a bit of a gradient and a bit of a flow acceleration across the LVOT, even more so if you have a septal bulge, you can see that on echo. On echo, aliasing starts upstream of the valve. You get a continuum of flow acceleration and pressure gradient that peaks at the aortic valve. This continuum is particularly seen in patients with septal bulge. This is part of the AS physiology. This is not LVOT obstruction. This is not mixed AS HOCOM, unless the gradient at the LVOT is higher than the gradient at the aortic valve. Hence, I like to put the catheter uh, deep in the apex. Otherwise, if you put your catheter in the LVOT like here, you can attenuate the gradient. This is an example I showed earlier. I use here an end hole catheter and I did pull back from the LV, that uh, orange curve from the LV to the aorta. You can see that the one beat in the LVOT here, this one, just before the aorta has less gradient than the deep catheter because of this LVOT flow acceleration, which again is not LVOT obstruction. It is rather part of AS flow acceleration. On occasion, if the pressure drop across the LVOT is more pronounced than the pressure drop across the aortic valve, then this patient would have a predominantly a HOCOM and an LVOT obstruction rather than an aortic stenosis. But that's not the case here, and that's not the case in the majority of patients who have calcific, heavily calcified aortic stenosis and a heavy gradient and some LVOT acceleration. This is an example of the opposite of what I just described. This is a continuous wave uh, Doppler waveform across the aortic valve, and it shows the superimposition of two distinct waveforms. One, an early rounded waveform, which corresponds to aortic stenosis, and another much higher late peaking dagger shaped one, which is a dynamic LVOT obstruction. Unlike the prior case where the aortic velocity and the aortic gradient was highest, in this case, the LVOT velocity is highest here and is this patient's primary predominant pathology. He has severe LVOT obstruction and concomitant mild aortic stenosis.